Lately, budget mini PCs have been really interesting, thanks to some decently powerful chips from Intel. And Alder Lake N replaces the Celeron and Pentium branding from previous years. Don't ask me why. The Morphine M9 is the first mini PC out on the market, featuring the entry-level quad-core Intel N100. Um, I guess you could call it a Celeron? Thanks, Intel. Thanks, Steve. Who's Steve? So when Morphine got in touch to provide a free sample, I was keen on checking out what the new CPU is capable of. But little did I know, the M9 mini PC would be full of surprises, starting with its appearance. Now the product images don't do it justice. I think this is a damn fine looking mini PC, which is really saying something for a budget unit. It takes design cues from Intel NUX and amps it up to N100. Oh, I see what I did there. The pristine CNC cut metal case is a complete surprise for the budget end. Yes, I'm sure it's metal this time. I've got the magnet to prove it. And I actually don't mind the branding on the top of the glossy lid, as it looks nice. The top is reflective, so I can see my own mug in it. Add to that the clean port layout and large airflow inlets on the sides, and it's a beauty from a design perspective. In fact, for aesthetics, I give it five bangers out of five. It looks and feels like a premium mini PC, and I like it. I like it a lot. Just be prepared to clean the top lid if you so much as touch it. The small cube power supply it comes with looks nice too, but you also get a HDMI cable, quick start guide, monitor mount, screws, and in my box, there was also an Oz travel adapter, which is nice to see for once. Yeah, I know we're built different. That's why our toilets flush in the opposite direction. On the front, there's dual USB 3, 5 gigabit, and the power button. On the rear, another two USB 3, 5 gigabit, dual HDMI, 2.0, 2.5 gigabit LAN, which you definitely don't find on the budget minis, audio, and barrel jack for power. A USB-C would have been nice, or just more USB in general, as the NUC 11 Essential has six ports, which is useful when you use a wired mouse and keyboard like yours truly. The M9 comes with Windows 11 Pro if you buy the pre-build, which is what I was sent. Or you can get the bare bones version and add your own memory, storage, and OS. On the website, the bare bones comes in at around 200 US dollars, which is pretty competitive pricing against the Intel and Arc 11 Essential. Okay, let's open her up and have a look inside. Oh my god. This is the greatest day of my life. The screws uncovered by sticky rubber feet. Oh yeah. Four screws, then use a prying tool or your fingers to get the lid off. Inside this pre-build is a Kyoxia NVMe drive. There's also space for an M.2 2242 SATA SSD, which is impressive on the budget end. Unfortunately, there's only one DDR4 memory slot, which means a single channel memory configuration only, and may affect graphics performance. The bottom plastic lid has space for a 2.5 inch drive, but there's no SATA port to plug into. Taking out the RAM and SSD, we've got the CMOS battery underneath for easy access. The M.2 Wi-Fi Bluetooth card is also here, but we need to go deeper to check out the cooling. To get the board out, these four hex standoffs need to be removed. Next, we unscrew the M.2 Wi-Fi card. I find it easiest to lift the board by the M.2 socket. Check that out compared to the last budget mini PC I reviewed. It's got a proper fan, copper heatsink, and screws off a nice chunky copper pipe. Oh, I feel a huge chubby coming on. Five minutes later. Okay, I'm back. So, it's easy to disassemble, but a bit more difficult to put back together again. I give this a moderately easy rating if you've got a toolkit. For those that don't want to use Windows, happy to report Ubuntu worked fine straight off the USB. Chrome OS Flex, on the other hand, failed to boot off the USB with just a black screen and restart. Barebones buyers will need to use the contact form on the Morphine website to have the driver link sent to them. I think this needs to be handled better, with download links for each model on the website instead. Anyway, while I didn't know what to expect from Alder Lake N, I was still surprised by the benchmark scores. Remember, this is the N100, which is at the bottom of the lineup. In single core, it dominates completely which had me do a double take. I remember in my NUC 11 Essential Pentium review, I had hoped for a Cinebench single core score of 300. Well, 
The entry level N100 hits 353, which is a 30% increase over the Pentium score. Single core is very important for that snappy and responsive Windows feel. The M9 felt really nice and responsive in Windows compared to something like the Blackview MP60 I reviewed earlier, which definitely had a more sluggish feel to it. In multi-core, the N100 again comes out on top. The score of 1092 is 25% faster than the NUC11 Pentium. I'm using Cinebench R20 scores here as I don't have R23 data for the last generation units. But here's a quick look at the R23 data of the N100 for single and multi-core. As expected, video encoding is another win for the Morphine M9 with a 21% improvement. Time for graphics. The N100 falls into second place, 16% behind the Pentium in DX11. It's again in second place in DX12 with an 18% lower score. Is it in second place because of the single channel memory? Or would it be in second place either way? But then how much are we losing percentage wise? There's no way to know until I test an N100 with dual channel memory. And that's why comparisons are so important and reviewing units in a vacuum isn't useful. Whatever the case, the N100 still beats all the other Celerons with single channel memory. So, pretty impressive, right? I definitely wasn't expecting such a large leap in performance out of the entry level CPU. It sure made me geek out, and that doesn't happen very often. With YouTube playback, I haven't yet come across a budget unit that doesn't drop frames running with a 4K desktop resolution. And the N100 isn't any different. A 1080p 60fps, 19 frames out of 10,000 were dropped. At 1440p 60fps, it jumped to 27 frames. And at 4K 60fps, 28 frames were dropped out of 10,000. Still, a pretty good result. In all three scenarios, most frames were dropped at the beginning after hitting play, which is most common. While I never recommend budget minis for games, it's fun to test the improvements against the previous generations. I was really curious how a CPU heavy esports game like Valorant would perform, as it didn't run great on the fastest Pentium. Well, check it out. A big difference. In a game where a decent frame rate matters, the NUC11 Essential Pentium was unplayable due to the huge fluctuations and drops into the 40s. The N100, on the other hand, stayed mostly above 60 FPS, and I thought it was playable. But to answer a question I'm sure I'll get, no, Fortnite won't be a good experience on either Mini as it's pretty GPU heavy for a competitive game title. In the majority of cases with emulation at the budget Mini end, more GPU power is needed. But let's see how the M9 goes head to head with the NUC11 Essential, starting with one of the toughest to emulate PS2 games. Gran Turismo 4. While both are being hammered on the GPU side, the faster CPU cores in the N100 actually help achieve a better frame rate. Neither is full speed, but the N100 is up to 20% faster. The toughest to emulate GameCube games are also out of reach for both minis at this resolution. Need for Speed Most Wanted isn't even close to 60 FPS. The M9 has more of a GPU bottleneck, while both the GPU and CPU take turns bottlenecking on the NUC depending on the area. Okay, last one. Mario Kart Wii runs close to full speed on the NUC thanks to the better graphics performance, but stays under 60 FPS on the M9 due to the weaker graphics. But you can see the N100 CPU is having a much easier time compared to the Pentium. In the BIOS, I didn't find too much interesting stuff, but this one is clean and quick to go through. You can change the fan speed settings, but the default is fine. And that's about it really. It's fully Windows 11 compatible. Idle power draw falls in line with most of the previous generation budget minis at 9 watts. Max power was identical with both the Morphine M9 and NUC11 Essential Pentium at 34 watts. Max NVMe SSD device temp of the included Kyoxia drive hit 76C, which is high. This is where the NUX thermal pad connected to the bottom metal lid for heat dissipation really pays off. Maximum CPU temp is 76, which is great. While it's a bit higher than the Intel NUX 73, the Morphine M9 is the quieter unit. In the never-ending pursuit of improving the benchmarking and reviewing process, this year 
I'll be looking out for performance inconsistencies, usually down to the VRM getting too hot due to insufficient cooling. I'm happy to report the Morphine M9 had consistent performance throughout my tests. Okay, so let's check out the pros and cons of the Morphine M9 Mini PC. It's a great looking box with a high quality metal case and is the first unit out the door with the latest Intel N100 CPU. It's also the only budget mini PC I've reviewed to have 2.5 gigabit LAN and dual M.2 storage slots. It's got good CPU cooling. The price tag, starting at just over $200 US, is pretty competitive considering what you get. However, the M9 is a mini PC with only a single DDR4 memory slot, which likely means some graphics performance is lost when running in its single channel configuration. There are only four USB ports, compared to six on the Intel NUC Essential. And there's no M.2 cooling. I tried to come up with a fourth one, but really, it's a pretty cool mini PC with more things to like. But if you're looking for a lot more power, do check out my review of the Morphine M600, featuring the powerful AMD Ryzen 6900HX CPU. It games pretty darn well. Cheers!